There we go. Oh, oh, for one brief moment, I saw all the models silhouetted against the lights of the runway, and then they were gone. I'm Victor, and straight out of the Gen Experience, a stylish new personality was invited to join the upper echelon of America's royalty. But what was a supermodel? Who were those talented, gorgeous businesswomen? And how do we have George Michael to thank for them? Happy New Year, everyone, and thanks to all of you who helped me reach a personal YouTube goal this last November. Here's to all of your goals in 2024. Now, on to the runway. I can't remember a time before supermodels, but I do know that their heyday has come and gone. They graced every magazine from glamour to vogue, but they weren't new to our generation. Models have been around for centuries and runway shows have dazzled for decades. However, during the gen experience, a seldom turned phrase became commonplace in our lexicon. The women who dominated were no longer celebrity outliers in a niche industry, but elevated by change in the 1970s to omnipresent superstars in their own right. Each one a brand, a star that burned brighter than some of the biggest in Hollywood. In an effort to stay relevant, Janice Dickinson, yes this one, once made up some tall tale that it was she who coined the term supermodel. An undeniable early superstar on the catwalk, she says it rolled off her tongue to her agent one day and then she demanded to be called that moving forward. The truth is, the phrase was not new and had been written in various forms of copy and print since the dawn of the 20th century. However, it would not be until the tail end of the 80s that it would be used more verbally and mean something very specific. Canadian born of Italian immigrants, Linda Evangelista was signed to Elite Modeling when she moved to New York in 1981 where endless work followed. She was known for her remarkable resemblance to Sophia Loren and was the face of Versace in 1989 and Revlon in 1990. Dramatically cutting her hair short almost got her canceled for shows. Before a public 360 embraced the hairstyle as cutting edge, beginning a trend of changing her coif and color regularly earned her the nickname the Chamberlain. Claudia Schiffer stated in 2007 that in order to become a supermodel, one must be on all covers, all over the world, all at the same time, so that people could recognize um, the girls. But it is probably more legit to say that when the models caught the self-promotion bug, where many scored individual deals with recognized name brands, knowing that product meant knowing the model. This name and face recognition would affect change, slowly at first. Raised in Oakland, California, Christy Turlington began modeling at 14. At 18 and in New York City, she appeared in Duran Duran's Notorious video before signing a record-setting seven-figure contract with Calvin Klein in 1989. The New York Met named her the face of the 20th century and in 1993 created a line of mannequins in her likeness. Honor or creepy? You decide. Her deal was certainly a huge payout, but she wasn't the first to do it. Lauren Hutton made the first cosmetic contract back in 1973. Certainly not for the money Christie had, but Lauren also leveraged this new visibility and the countless media attention into film roles, including the starring female in American Gigolo with Richard Gere. Ernest Hemingway's granddaughter Margot, yes, that Ernest Hemingway, followed Lauren with a $1 million deal for Fabergé, which upped her game, but opportunities outside of modeling barely materialized. But time to give credit where credit is due. Sports Illustrated, yes, a magazine that people used to read. Or at least look at the pictures, especially when it came to the anticipated annual swimsuit issue. Even if you didn't read it, you knew about it, as that issue was released with as much fanfare as the Olympic opening ceremonies. Sports Illustrated editor Jewel Campbell turned her back on the then current pencil thin modeling trends of Twiggy and Jerry Hall by photographing bigger and healthier California models for the popular issue, going as far as to also print their full name with their photos, a first, leading to many more achieving household recognition. This turning point may have you start recognizing some of the most famous of the period. They may have been super to many of us, but still didn't come in blazon with that label. As the 70s came to a close, the likes of Christy Brinkley, who has the distinction of the longest running cosmetic contract with CoverGirl for 25 years, and Kathy Ireland and Elle McPherson, they were among the new and instantly familiar. The British-born Naomi Campbell studied dance and theater early on, even landing herself roles in The Cosby Show and Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, while also being known for appearing in Bob Marley and Culture Club music videos. 
At 16, Elle magazine gave her the first major modeling gig, and she soon found herself the first black model on Western magazines like Vogue in 1987 and Time magazine in 1991. With that much clout, Campbell had endless runway shows lined up when Michael Jackson called with an offer. Not taking no for an answer, he proceeded to pay to get her out of her tour contract and fly her to the California desert to film in his beautiful but oft-forgotten video, In the Closet. But in 1981, supermodel was not yet uttered in common nomenclature. Top model or new, fresh face were all fairly ubiquitous. In October that same year, Life magazine cited Shelley Hack, Lauren Hutton, and Amon for Revlon. Margot Hemingway for Fabergé, Karen Graham for Estee Lauder, Christina Ferrar for Max Factor, and Cheryl Teeks for CoverGirl, and proclaimed them the million dollar faces of the beauty industry. These million dollar faces were negotiating previously unheard of lucrative and exclusive deals with giant cosmetic companies. Instantly, they were recognizable, and their names finally became well-known fixtures to the general public, and they began being seen in public more with A-list stars and power players. Cheryl Teagues has seemingly been unofficially retconned with the moniker of first American supermodel, becoming a cultural icon during the 1970s. In addition to covers of Vogue, Cosmo, Harper's Bazaar, and Glamour magazines, she appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated, People, Newsweek, and Us with the caption, Why She's America's Top Model. Her 1978 pink bikini poster became a symbol of 70s pop culture and was the second best-selling poster of that decade. I bet this audience knows whose was the best-selling poster. You may have heard the term top model, but Cheryl was trailblazing for the soon-to-be-crowned official supermodels by signing the biggest cosmetic contract at the time, a five-year $1.5 million deal with CoverGirl, starting in 1979. The 80s also brought the first time that models were signing exclusive contracts with actual fashion houses. Inez de la Frisange was first. Many followed with even more famous brands. Their stars rose and sometimes eclipsed the Beverly Hills actor types for media attention and influence. No longer individuals, but images. Images who were not only in print, but were now guests on popular shows, doing live interviews and hosting television and world events. While some dipped their toe in a variety of acting roles, models had made their way to mainstream media and mega stardom, and the traction was only gaining. Cindy Crawford began modeling as she graduated from high school as their valedictorian. Not thinking twice about doing both modeling and her college major of chemical engineering, she soon found juggling both difficult and took the more lucrative route, modeling. After the 1986 cover of Vogue with her full-bodied athletic physique, Cindy was the first major model to pose nude for Playboy, a gamble that paid off. It even helped her get her first show gig, House of Style in 1989, which had a 50% male audience. She starred alongside Billy Baldwin in a ridiculous action movie bomb where Leonard Malton had this to say about her acting. In her film debut, Cindy Crawford makes a great jogger. Nothing gets her down and while juggling married life and children, she still finds time to work. Although retiring officially in 2000 after posing a second time for Playboy, Crawford still demands attention as a powerful businesswoman, and even found time to duplicate her performance from Freedom 90 for Lip Sync Battle, and be part of a more modern television show about the world of high fashion and modeling. For any of you out there who might be missing my often toy-related content, Crawford is only one of two supermodels to have their likeness made into an official doll. So there's that. If Barbie can be a teen model for almost 65 years, why not Cindy? By the 1990s, the supermodel was ever present and prominent in the media. Although Paulina Poroskova, Amon, Isabella Rossellini, the daughter of Ingrid Bergman, and Claudia Schiffer would just as easily fall into the category, it was a serendipitous photo shoot for British Vogue in 1989 that would ignite a franchise. Cindy, Linda, Naomi, Tatiana, and Christy were the five models selected for this iconic image. The issue of Vogue was released in January 1990 and an opportunity was seized. The quintessential cover of these famous world-class beauties garnered so much attention that almost instantly the industry changed. Immediately after its release, superstar singer George Michael approached the whole lot of them to star in his next music video venture. I'm sure you've all seen it, and therefore seen the first time these movers and shakers of the fashion world were on screen in the same project. Freedom 90 doesn't even feature Michael himself. He enlisted the Big Five to represent his tale of breaking free from the bonds of his own music industry chains, just like these women had by freeing themselves of the fashion business model through diversification and breaking the glass ceiling. 
In 1991, Gianni Versace turned around and hired the Big Five to simultaneously walk the runway, accompanied by that groundbreaking video at his 1991 Couture show. Eliciting a standing ovation from the audience, this event, believed by many industry professionals, is said to mark the official debut of The Supermodel a top fashion model who appears simultaneously on the covers of the world's leading fashion magazines and is globally recognized by first name only. That is all but one. At 17 in 1983, the just shy of six foot Tatiana Petit's placed in an elite modeling contest with a simple Polaroid. Her exotic heritage landed her on British Vogue at 19, her first major cover. In 1987, in what is regarded as the definitive cover of the magazine in the 80s, Tatjana was photographed for American Vogue. It was without fanfare, Tatjana was casually replaced with Claudia Schiffer. Modeling was what she did, not what she wanted to do. She had already stolen away to Malibu with her son in 1989 when others called New York or LA home. Leaving the limelight behind at her peak, before supermodels became monsters. I never ever said in any of my interviews that I would never get out of bed for $10,000. No, either. And then replaced by gray and anonymous waifs. One year ago next week, having never become just a first name, Tatjana Petitz died of breast cancer. Claudia was already ingrained into the big five, about to become the big six, when Kate Moss was adopted into the fold. The title affirmed these women's hard work, work that was nonstop since the mid 80s, the title became equivalent to superstar, to signify a model's fame having risen simply from previously a lesser known personality. This was the era where a model like Turlington signed a contract with Maybelline that paid her $800,000 for 12 days of work each year. But like the Brad Pack, where there is an official list and yet countless others who everyone considers part of the assemblage, there are others who did much of the same as Crawford, Campbell, or Turlington, rose from the ranks, branched out, secured deals, and sustained the fame. They may not have been branded with the unofficial official label, but should be remembered as the smart and beautiful women who blazed a trail for those coming up in the industry. Even the Barbie twins, who have a bit cheekier history, have a story to share. By the way, check out my Brat Pack show via the link in the description for more on the gang. But who were the new up-and-comers? They were young hopefuls with lofty expectations of the business. They came with delusions of instant gratification and reward. Expectation that led to the Is that I would never get out of bed for $10,000. Attitudes that had fashion houses and editors eventually having to swing the pendulum back the opposite direction. They were also the influx of international models where English was not a first language and therefore did not possess the business prowess or capitalistic ingenuity of the American woman. Without the resources, suddenly there was no more interviews, no more hosting televised events or opportunities to be seen other than on billboards or runways. They were also those who arrived too young, glorifying a heroin chic with their emaciated frames that wouldn't benefit the major companies or even Hollywood. However, Hollywood was happy to fill the void the supermodels once owned as the face of major cosmetic companies. Revlon and Max Factor were happy to partner with established stars who had sustainability and visibility without the whims of a new entitled model. The expectation of wealth and fame without earning it would leave these new models with anonymity they did not anticipate. By the late 90s and into the 2000s, the same opportunities were no longer available to even the most praised models. Tyra Banks and Heidi Klum had to go into reality TV as fashion houses were looking for the unknowns. And Victoria's Secret was still molding fresh new faces to rise from the fashion industry like a stable of talent, just without the same power they once yielded. As the world continues to change too fast these days, other factors pressured by social media and social justice has made the industry rot for change and representation. Some very necessary, some completely laughable. Great deals are still signed here and there, but without the clout, these contracts pale in comparison to the impact of those that came before. But once upon a time, during the celebrity-obsessed era of the 80s and 90s, the supermodel made their mark, planted their feet, and made it clear they were here. Even if only for a little while. The undisputed title holders of Supermodel earned those crowns and will forever be a little slice of the Gen Extinct history. Thanks for joining me on this rollicking journey through the Gen Experience, a fascinating tale of something truly preserved by an era. If you enjoyed it as much as I did making it, please click the like and think about supporting my channel by subscribing. To all new and returning viewers, thank you so much for being here and please check out other great content from the Gen Experience. Until next time.